We're here on our honeymoon, and we just got married, as a lot of people know. We've had a lot of time together, and romantic time, and driving time, and thinking time. It's been really good. And it definitely seems like we're at a crossroads. Or at least we're coming up to something bigger, I hope. Of course, between us, getting married is a huge step really important personally and our work is always growing changing moving along of course with the news and the things that happen but it just seems like there's so much bigger something that something is just so much more out there and I absolutely know we're thinking about it because we've had the chance to reflect we're out here in West Texas in the desert we're away from civilization and watching movies and chilling out and listening to radio and stuff and it's mainly just the two of us, and there's a few people out here if we really had to find somebody. It's a lot of gorgeous mountains. The sky and the sunset tonight was, it was beautiful. We're close enough to food and the things we need to survive. I think we'll be all right. But we're basically away from civilization. And last night we got to go to what I think is the greatest observatory for civilians, for the little people, for the regular folks in the entire continental sta uh, United States at the McDonald Observatory out here near Fort Davis. You know, it's in West Texas. Uh, it's up on the Davis Mountains, which are not record-setting mountains or anything. However, something about being out here just really sets the conditions. It's brilliant clear skies. I think it's far enough away from any major cities that there's no light pollution to speak of and it was a pretty good night and we saw the stars and through some very large telescopes they let the public look through we saw Jupiter which uh, one time I also got to see Saturn through we saw uh, a, a nebula on Orion a nebula of Orion with a brilliant blue dust and four baby stars that according to what they say or what they know about science right now, they say the gases are there and forming and they're incubating. These stars are coming into maturity of life. And they've been there 10,000 years, which is nothing for stars. But that predates, what, a lot of written civilization, not quite all of it. It predates, obviously, any of our lives uh, here out there listening to this by quite a ways and I guess yeah, it's stuff like that that gives you the perspective. Looking at the moon from a different angle, from a real high magnification, and just being up there and seeing the stars in general in a different light. You know, we saw the we saw some satellites moving through the sky. We saw the International Space Station. We had a lot of constellations were pointed out to us, and amazing. it was amazing. It's just a great time to think about how big everything is. We also watched, they screen an educational film called The Powers of Ten. It's made by this couple back in the 50s or 60s called The Eames, I think. I've seen it before, but every time you see it, it'll make you think. It looks kind of dated. And who knows if, if the things they portray in there is being scientifically true. But the concept behind it, Powers of Ten, that as you move up, out into space, uh, a sh at first a short ways and then a tremendous space and then in, in volumes of forever and in intervals of can't even measure it it's so clear that our lives are incredibly huge and everything we're interacting with we seem in such a limited paradigm and things are set in a certain way and it's so hard to beat the powers and then on the bigger perspective it's just waves and patterns and in the bigger perspective it's we're just sitting on a giant flat disk in a spiraling galaxy that's within a universe that knows no limits and the film you know in the 70s portrayed itself to know what's going on in our creation and our reality based off of a meter right so they know what's going on to I don't know several thousand maybe a million light years or something away from us they think they know how the patterns of space move and kind of what space clouds are like and how empty it gets out there after you pull back far enough from the pattern. And the second half of the film, you zoom in so far, you're into the cells of the body, way past the skin, 
you've browsed past the DNA and you're down to the smallest known particles, you know, quarks inside of the nucleus of an atom, you know, past all the little elements, and wow, it's just so big. I don't pretend to have an explanation for it all, but it's all happening on so many levels. Of course, the microcosm effect has to be there. What is so tiny somehow holds true to what is infinitely large. And we fit in between that. We're, I guess we're in the zero zone. We're not infinitely small, but we're awfully small compared to the universe. I don't know quite what to take away from that. You know, it's almost like there's a level where we're cogs of the machine. And kind of moving along in society. But we have to remember, man really has no authority. Any of it. Some of it might be good ideas, but all these rules in society and the things that have been set up and the way things are moving, the, the things that happen that are incredible, you know, horrible, even though they're corrupt, unbelievable, some of the hypocrisies that are played out. But I guess we have to remember that man doesn't have any true authority over any of that. Just a minute. This is supposed to be a trial. Who says I'm guilty of anything? Where's your proof? The state needs no proof. We're kind of operating in our environment here. And there's so much more going on. There's patterns to it and there's laws of the universe and laws of nature that we're following and some of man's laws reflect that and seem reasonable under those conditions and some of them are absurd and they're a tyranny against us and they're oppressing people but we have to remember who's really in charge it, you can call it God you can choose not to call it God as many people do it's definitely not us <laughs> we're <laughs> gosh we're not even insignificant, we're just... There are two worlds or realms, the physical and the spiritual. One of these, the spiritual realm, cannot be seen or known by the physical senses alone. But we could still be pivotal to it all. It's like we can shine. We can be carriers of the majesty that happens on all these scales, big and small and in between, the neutral size, Maybe we're the neutral size since it's our experience and we're taking it face value and we're seeing things through our own eyes and we're operating in our own dimension, our own space, and our own size. But there's a play going on. There's a huge theater reading. Somebody's got the script and it's being followed along. And if they've got the patterns right about what happens in space at these huge scales, then it's playing out and it's these crazy waves and spirals and galaxies are getting absorbed into other galaxies and black holes are emptying things out and preparing cycles to begin again and entire stars bigger than our sun in spaces that we can't fathom in places where our ships probably can't ever travel to are playing out according to these same dramas and these same cycles and their lives maybe are comparable to ours just on different scales but the same thing but I guess I take from that that we have to remember what we're doing is significant too, even as we appreciate and respect the fact that in the grand scheme we're not completely significant, but simultaneously we completely are significant. It is possible today to determine the exact chemical composition of a human body. If we were to make these tests one moment before death, and then again one moment after death, it would be obvious that something was missing but it would be something that you couldn't see, weigh, measure, or put in a test tube. That something is life. It's, I mean, yeah, we can't go around and think, I'm the most important person in this room, or I'm the most important person in this world, but at the same time, we're, we're not insignificant, we're very important. And what we do matters, and for us to do the right thing, as we say, matters. And we could debate who's making the rules for that morality system and where we get the cues for what's truly important. Where we get the cues for what it is that we're really supposed to do. What else can you do but hear the inner voice and try to look at the bigger pattern? 
I don't know how you balance the fact that you're completely significant and yet you're you're also not. I guess we're kind of riding the wave. <laughs> it's incredible though. <laughs> Gosh, I wonder what they're not telling us the truth about about what's really on the moon or <laughs> if it's made of cheese or if it's a Star Wars drone base, if it's a Death Star, if it's a Truman Show base, if it's a Nazi UFO base, you know, you could see the layers of metaphor there. Is it really true or is there kind of a hidden truth in that stuff? I really wonder if they're telling us the truth about any of the things they photographed or figured out based on their measurements of light and their ability to send out probes. <laughs> You have to imagine with this government and the things they've been involved in, how much is not going to be subject to public disclosure. Everyone wonders about aliens, but the question's also put out there as a red herring. It's as much as it would be important to life and, and game-changing, it's also put out there in a red herring fashion to kind of draw blood and muddy the water and cloud things up a little. And we're just going to wade through that as we can. I don't. I'm not here to tell you what exactly is true and what isn't. I haven't got any great insights based on scientific data no one else has gotten to see. A few years ago, it was quite popular to say, I will believe nothing that I cannot see or handle or know with my physical senses. Today, this attitude is considered quite unscientific. But I do think that there's something we're trying to figure out. And I feel strongly that as small as I am in the true grand scheme of things, and as hard as it is to even change things on the scale of man, with the corruption that's set in and the powerful people and their money, which is just as much an illusion as any of man's authority. Propaganda as an art. Sabotage as a business. This nameless American city. But still operating under that, it's so hard to just even change a few things, even a basic policy. But we've got to remember that it does make a difference somehow. I don't know exactly how it all figures in. <laughs> but it's so plain to see sometimes when you get a chance, when you're at a crossroads, when you've had some big life events, or I guess just some time to kick back and look at the stars or look through some awesome telescopes which I do recommend anyone that has a chance to vacation in Texas it's a fantastic sky up here I'm still striving I don't I don't have the map I don't know where it is we're going this is the writing rock it looks like someone has written on it and yet have they worried God or the forces of nature over eons we could be fooled. Love you all. Much of modern science deals with very real quantities and qualities that are beyond the range of the physical senses. Do you realize that your most priceless possession is something that you can't see, weigh, or measure? I'm not always sure. I don't even know how many accomplishments I've really got on something that truly makes a difference. It's just... Maybe it's the striving itself that seems to make the difference, or the fact that I can see through certain deceptions and others can't. Or that I'm trying to show people the way to it, or... I don't know how that adds up. I know it's not all in me. <laughs> I mean, I figured that out a long time ago. I never had any illusions of being the best of the best or any of that. And yet, my raw experiences seem to affect other people, and the path I'm on sometimes seems true, and I get reinforcements from... Invisible supporters and shining cues from symbols and star-lighted dots along the path that maybe I'm on the right trail. <laughs> maybe I'm totally lost in the woods. But it's all part of that big pattern. Uh, I feel like I got just kind of a bit, uh, just maybe a little tiny glimpse of it all. Just for a second. It, it gets difficult, you know, to to try to do the right thing with this reporting and wondering if even covering the news matters half the time. 
It gets difficult to keep covering this stuff day in and day out anyhow. Sometimes it might get boring, and sometimes it just seems like we're rehashing the same crap. Just kind of going on what is fearful or what's sensational enough to catch eyes when it's a current event and people seem to think that's something that's really important. It's not a current event anymore, a 9-11, a JFK, a declassified CIA document. How important is that for us to take a few steps back and realize we were all duped into going along with something. You know, I saw 9-11 that day. I was in a... I was in university, I was in my class, and my professor came up and all he said was he was canceling class because of what had happened that day and he had no words for it. And that was the first news I heard of it. I didn't know what he was talking about until we walked outside and we overheard some people chattering. We walked down the sidewalk next to the university and they were already selling newspapers with the towers exploding, or with the towers being hit rather, because they hadn't collapsed at that point. It was already headline news and for sale. <laughs> a big event, really, actually, just like they portray in the JFK movie. When do they ever get on the street to tell you that up-to-date news? Well, apparently on the day that we're attacked, they're out there right away. Special edition. I know, my, I know one of my friends has that somewhere. I went home, and that's when we finally turned on the TV. And they were replaying the towers quite a bit. And it wasn't too long before the collapse thing had happened, because this was all in the span of an hour. And watching the TV, the things they said, the, I recognized propaganda at that point, because I studied news, I was in government studies, and we were talking about things, not of a 9-11 theme, but important, you know, some worthwhile things. And I had seen an account about bin Laden, and it was about how horrible him and this Taliban group were and how they were determined to attack America. That was about June. It didn't mean anything to me at the time. I knew he had been blamed for the coal bombings, he and his group, whatever, USS coal bombings. But it was kind of like, okay, a story about the Taliban, a story about bin Laden in whatever it was, June, July, before the attacks. And uh, I did start remembering it, though that day that I had seen news about it and I saw early on the way they were exploiting it and I can't remember if they literally faded, I think they did, but if they didn't it was as if they had faded the face of Bin Laden over the towers once they had started collapsing and they had that footage to loop over and over and Another key element here as we try to piece together who did this and why it happened or from CBS News that just three weeks ago Osama bin Laden the most wanted terrorist in the world had promised an unprecedented attack on US interests because of this country's support for the nation of Israel what we're also being told is that the likelihood of this attack is that it's a, co a coordinated attack they, um, that was brought together by various Middle East groups that were acting together possibly in concert with Osama bin Laden and it just, it didn't take long, though, for it to set in. I mean, it was that day for me that I just looked at what they were showing, and the, <laughs> I already knew the effect it was going to be having around the world. And once they started linking it to bin Laden in such a short time, it, it just sunk in me suddenly. Damn. They did this, I said to myself. I didn't know exactly who they was, but I didn't mean... <laughs> Some shadowy terrorists who were the new worst enemy on TV. I meant somebody more like in charge or in the government or whatever. And it just hit me. They did this. And I started thinking about the Bin Laden propaganda. And it just... My stomach just sunk. And I turned off the TV. I didn't watch any more for the rest of the day. But it was weeks that went by. And obviously that was just about the only thing anyone seemed to be talking about. And in particular, I remember everyone seemed to have known somebody, somehow, that had been in the towers that day or died in the towers that day. But everyone became suddenly connected to that place. Somehow, you knew somebody. It turned out that someone you knew through someone, the Kevin Bacon effect had happened on those towers. 
And whether you did or not, that was the feeling you were meant to have. Was the connection to those towers and the attack and the official story of it, and the fact that it was supposed to be this attack on all of us, which it was, but the truth of it was twisted. And I just had that sinking feeling that day, like, oh no, they did this, and these people are going to believe it, and I felt so disconnected from everybody. I didn't know a thing what to do about it. I wasn't a truther or an activist for 9-11 for years. I didn't know about the the theories, which I think are probably have some serious merit about how Building 7 fell and the possible use of explosives and the, the various government conspiracies surrounding it, all the involvement of the Bush administration, the PNAC, and everything else people who are informed on this have heard about. That all came later, but that day and in those first few days and weeks, it really hit me as a mass-level propaganda effect, and I vowed to myself not to watch a whole bunch of TV, because I expected it, I literally expected it to be brainwashing, and we all know that's what happened, and I don't have any other special insights other than I saw it coming, that this would be used as a mass conditioning effect, didn't know, obviously, where they planned to go to war or what exactly they planned to do with it. But I saw it being used as a propaganda weapon, as an event of brain distortion. Okay, that's what I saw coming that day. So I saw 9-11 not from a theory of this one particular set of events happen, and if it's disproven, then everyone can go home and believe the government again. I saw it as a a mind warp, and it happened, and it's there, and whoever becomes the authority on this, under man or just under the universe, they can sort out just exactly what happened, but I feel like here under this gigantic universe with all its levels and planes of existence and perspectives that diminish or enhance things and make them seem important, you know, it's those kind of events that when you really kind of noticed them and noticed what they did to people at the time it was happening, I mean, that's why I'm here on this journey. It's moments like that where everything's changing and you're in a perspective to see that it's changing. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. What to do about it, I'm not quite sure, but I never let go of it, you know. And I was thinking earlier about that quote from the JFK movie. I can't quote it, I could paraphrase it. All the pursuit of the JFK, what really happened with that assassination, completely twisted and an even bigger mind warp because it was a time when there were only three television channels and the conspiracy death of Oswald was the first televised death ever seen on TV and it was real but at the same time in the sense that there was an unseen conspiracy behind it it was also not real and was used a great propaganda effect and probably multiplied the already shocking effect of the president's death and assassination in the time and days of television, think about what that did to people. Everyone who could get near a TV got near a TV and seeped in that stuff. All the things they said. Watch someone die. They watched someone die, the violence of that trauma going out on the airwaves. And they soaked in the, the propaganda aspects of it. What should be done about it? How we should think differently about society because it happened. New safeguards that should be adopted, and anything and everything. I mean, gun control was introduced in part because of the murder of JFK and the, and Bobby Kennedy and MOK, right? Later in 1968. All these things happened that were so pivotal in the 60s. And not all of it was because of the assassination or a side effect of it, but things got so twisted because of it. And they got inside everyone's head that day. And anyone who cares to be honest with themselves and look at the evidence can see that it's obviously a conspiracy. I've got my inklings and my idea of how the story goes, and so does everyone. Who knows? Okay? 
I mean, I, I do feel like I kind of know, but still, who knows? But what is certain, let's be certain in that uncertainty, because we weren't clued in on it, okay? Let's be certain in the uncertainty that there was a, a massive warping that day. Whatever happened, <laughs> if the uh, if an alien had come down from the sky and pulled the trigger, the point is they still showed that to people and used it to its full effect, and they blamed it on people who hadn't really done it, and they used it for foreign policy that was twisted and corrupt, evil, of course. That's what we could see. We can't see the full perspective of everyone who's in on it to a detailed perspective, but no one will do time in any earthly prison or man-made punishment for that crime because that was what was decided. That's how powerful the conspirators were. I mean, it's pretty much a done deal, but you could see it. It's, you know, we watched Old Man in the Sea today, that Ernest Hemingway, there was an animated version of the short story he watched, and I was originally quoting from the JFK movie, the Oliver Stone movie, where they quoted from Old Man in the Sea, and they told they told Mr. Garrison that his case, you know, he said himself his case was like the Old Man in the Sea. He had the big fish, but he was so far out there at sea. And there were sharks, there's blood in the water. I mean, the whole real fish got eaten. You could see the carcass there. When he got to shore, everybody could see that he had caught the biggest fish anyone had ever heard of. But he didn't actually have it. But he still rode that wave, and yeah, that's like a pun intended. When he was out there in the grand scheme of it all, and he could have died at sea, he would have even been happy to die at sea. And he had perspective. It's so Greek in its scale, because it, it makes up these little significant stories to chase around these larger unexplained events. And yeah, we know the sun comes up each day and it goes down, but of course history didn't know for a while that it didn't go up and down because the earth was flatter because the earth was the center of the universe. You know, those theories have been disproven. The official version of truth is, is what it is, of course, with the solar system and all that. And whether that pans out to be true or not, our perspectives have changed around that. And yet... The pivotal nature of the sun and the moon, the stars and the sky and the sea, I mean, it just sounds even, sounds cliche to even list those things off as big important things in our life, but they're huge, especially if you live before the time of technology, especially if you didn't set your watch around anything, you woke up when the sun came up and you did certain activities by night. And you found your food by the sea or by certain areas of the land because of the way that the biggest natural events happen on a daily basis. And there was a larger perspective whether or not you understood the scientific meaning behind it. And if there were violations of that nature or distortions of it, you saw it from, its, from your relation to that nature and from the relation of that nature to those things that... Um, Weren't, weren't in harmony with it and we're in violation of where it's going and today we're so distorted with the age of technology they could tell us the snow is black that's what Bertrand Russell said and the impact of science on society they can brainwash kids in school and they know how much it costs to teach them something that's so absurdly wrong it's, it's stupid and it's going to confuse their whole lives and it's going to cause them to live under false illusions I mean, look what's happened with the technology. We've come out of touch with the most important things. Yeah, we laugh at someone who hundreds or thousands of years ago might have thought the sun rose around the earth. But unlike that person who didn't have the benefit of scientific knowledge, who was ignorant of that scientific fact, that person, however, had perspective on why it was important and why his own life needed to be in harmony with that great celestial movement, and perhaps he was part of a society with a ridiculous story about the stars he followed, if he was a mariner and on an ocean at night, or that he saw with his children, his wife, his family, as the sun set and they took shelter and went through their day. And it's great that we moved on from that and that we have light and we can cook food in our stoves and 
that we have scientific knowledge of how the earth works in relation to the universe. It's great that we have advanced knowledge where we can get good knowledge and where it's true. But what's not great is how much we've lost connection with the true perspective of why those things matter. We should move this technology forward and embrace it, but realize too how it's killing who we really are and how we're such city boys and city girls and so hooked on this stuff that not only do we believe vicious lies and really stupid crap. Did you know the ancient pyramids were actually a mistake? It's on TV and movies. Really ignorant, stupid, pointless crap sometimes. Because we... But that when we do come out into nature and more into the wilderness, I feel so bewildered by the movements of the sky. One of the most intriguing discoveries in modern science is the fact that there is nothing in this world that even approaches what might be called truly solid. We speak of solids, liquids, and gases. But these terms describe superficial rather than basic properties of matter. It's completely magic. Melissa just says magic. She's listening to me rant. It, it's completely magic, but, I mean, I'm not only ignorant of a lot of the scientific explanations. This piece of steel and any so-called solid substance on this earth is almost entirely empty space. I'm not really from a scientific background or anything, but from a mankind and his environment perspective, I feel like a fish out of water, Okay. And we're staying in a hotel. That hotel relies on technology. We're eating out of grocery stores. And although I know theoretically how it would work, what would I really do if I was out here and it was just mono e mono nature, sun, moon, and water where I might find it in this desert area, and mountains, not to mention all the wild creatures, many of which could harm me out here, what would I really do? Do I really, am I really better off for believing little fantasy lies from a group of men that we have been beaten into submission to recognize as our authorities, our betters, our superiors, to give them the benefit of the doubt whenever something doesn't seem to fit into place, to listen to the crap and the bullshit they play on TV? Are we really better off to go to these schools and learn these dumbed-down facts because everyone's not smart enough to learn that yet? It's up to you to get to class on time, prepared for the test, or whatever else the teacher has said the period will be devoted to. And, well, they got to teach it in a way that everyone can understand. And, well, hold on now, we're all kind of marching in a line here. Are we really better off for going down that path? when so many of us are completely cut off, despite all these advances, with the meaning of who we are on this planet and in this great universe. This isn't me. This is just the house I live in. Cut off my hand, that isn't me. Cut off my arm, that isn't me. Of course, if you keep on whittling, you'll get me, I'll admit that, but nevertheless, this is just the house I live in. That we're so disconnected from not only the God of the Bible or the God of... But from the actual sky and sea and earth that's around us that we walk on and sometimes swim on and see with our eyes and our senses. Completely cut off from that. No real connection. A very min minuscule, a very uh, grotesque and s stripped down and insufficient relationship with God, with this earth and with the true nature of of everything, we become less than men, not more than men, through all this technology and through the organizational technology of our society, we become, it's backward. When we see such a complex mechanism as this, and remember it's no larger than the head of a pin, man's best traps look strangely cold and ineffective by comparison. Man's progress has not been due to discovery of new things but merely to the uncovering of principles and devices that God ordained in nature. We're, we're lambs to the slaughter. We're dumbed-down people. We're little ogre trolls for them to march into submission and suck off of, to use up, to use as a buffer from someone stronger or more connected who might rise up and tell people what to do. We're uh, insulation and buffer and and fodder to our own possibility of changing our own system because of the crap 
We believe in in the group think that allows us to march obediently into line into what a lot of people know are lies and march obediently in line into this limited, disgusting, twisted crap. And for those that can see it being twisted, even when it happens, whatever it is that is really you or me is something that no man has ever seen. For those that have eyes to see and for those that have ears to hear, is it not finally time to stand up and, and just say that our society is a farce, that it's that this authority of man is an illusion and it's a, a really bad joke on nature and the universe to really just... Let's just admit to ourselves that, yeah, uh, obviously it's not really worthwhile to choose between a Bush and a Hillary. Uh, I'm sorry, a Bush and a Clinton, a Jeb and a Hillary, or a Ted Cruz or a Rand Paul or any of these other dweebs. <laughs> Neither is it in our interest to elect a Stalin or a Putin or a, you know, a Bin Laden to lead our tribes and etc., Unless they're at least at a bare minimum enough in tune with nature that we can be honest with ourselves about what's really going on, even if our condition's not real good, even if we find ourselves actually totally alone and in exile from that technological society out in the desert with not even enough to eat or shelter, but maybe we would at least have the substance of truth enough to realize whether or not we were in tune with nature and the sky and the sun and the moon, in whatever little measly conception our distorted, puny, stunted, untrained, non-muscular minds can figure out of what God is supposed to be. Before we can see or enter this spiritual realm, a change must take place in us that is so fundamental and far-reaching that it can best be described as new birth. kind of at a crossroads here and I think Melissa is too and she can say what she wants to say about it when she feels ready <sighs> yeah I that's what I think about the truth of things reality based off of a meter right so they know what's going on to I don't know, several thousand, maybe a million light years or something away from us. They think they know how the patterns of space move and kind of what space clouds are like and how empty it gets out there after you pull back far enough from the pattern. And the second half of the film, you zoom in so far, you're into the cells of the body, way past the skin. You browse past the DNA and you're down to the smallest known particles. Mm -hmm quarks inside of the nucleus of an atom, you know, past all the little elements, and wow, it's just so big. I don't pretend to have an explanation for it all, but it's all happening on so many levels. Of course, the microcosm effect has to be there. What is so tiny somehow holds true to what is infinitely large, and we fit in between that. We're, I guess we're in the zero zone. We're not infinitely small, but we're awfully small compared to the universe. I don't know quite what to take away from that. You know, it's almost like there's a level where we're cogs of the machine. And kind of moving along in society. But we have to remember, man really has no authority. Any of it. Some of it might be good ideas, but all these rules. We're here on our honeymoon. And we just got married, as a lot of people know. We've had a lot of time together, and romantic time, and driving time, and thinking time. And it's been really good. And it definitely seems like we're at a crossroads. Or at least we're coming up to something bigger, I hope. Of course, between us, getting married is a huge step. Really important, personally. And our work is always growing, changing, moving along, of course, with the news and the things that happen but it just seems like there's so much bigger something, that something is just so much more out there. And I absolutely know we're thinking about it because we've had the chance to reflect. We're out here in West Texas, in the desert. We're away from civilization and watching movies and chilling out and listening to radio and stuff. And it's mainly just the two of us, and there's a few people out here if we really had to find somebody. 
It's a lot of gorgeous mountains. The sky and the sunset tonight was it was beautiful. We're close enough to food and the things we need to survive. I think we'll be all right. But we're basically away from civilization. And last night we got to go to what I think is the greatest observatory for civilians, for the little people, for the regular folks in the entire continental uh, United States at the McDonald Observatory out here near Fort Davis. You know, it's in West Texas. Uh, It's up on the Davis Mountains, which are not record-setting mountains or anything. However, something about being out here just really sets the conditions. It's brilliant clear skies. I think it's far enough away from any major cities that there's no light pollution to speak of and it was a pretty good night and we saw the stars and through some very large telescopes they let the public look through we saw jupiter which uh, one time i also got to see saturn through we saw uh, a, a nebula on orion a nebula of orion with a brilliant blue dust and four baby stars That according to what they say or what they know about science right now, they say the gases are there and forming and they're incubating. These stars are coming into maturity of life. And they've been there 10,000 years, which is nothing for stars. But that predates, what, a lot of written civilization, not quite all of it. It predates, obviously, any of our lives uh, here out there listening to this by quite a ways and I got you know, stuff like that that gives you the perspective. Looking at the moon from a different angle, from a real high magnification, and just being up there and seeing the stars in general in a different light. You know, we saw the we saw some satellites moving through the sky. We saw the International Space Station. We had a lot of constellations were pointed out to us, and amazing. it was amazing. It's just a great time to think about how big everything is we also watched they screen an educational film called the powers of 10 it's made by this couple back in the 50s or 60s called the eames i think i've seen it before but every time you see it it'll make you think it looks kind of dated and who knows if if the things they portray in there is being scientifically true but the concept behind it powers of 10 that as you move up out into space, uh, a sh- at first a short ways, and then a tremendous space, and then in, in volumes of forever, and in intervals of can't even measure it, it's so clear that our lives are incredibly huge, and everything we're interacting with, we seem in such a limited paradigm, and things are set in a certain way, and it's so hard to beat the powers. And then on the bigger perspective, it's just waves and patterns and in the bigger perspective it's we're just sitting on a giant flat disk in a spiraling galaxy that's within a universe that knows no limits and the film you know in the 70s portrayed itself to know what's going on in our creation and our rules in society and the things have been set up and the way things are moving the the things that happen that are incredible you know, horrible, even though they're corrupt, unbelievable, some of the hypocrisies that are played out. But I guess we have to remember that man doesn't have any true authority over any of that. Just a minute. This is supposed to be a trial. Who says I'm guilty of anything? Where's your proof? The state needs no proof. We're kind of operating in our environment here. And there's so much more going on. There's patterns to it, and there's laws of the universe and laws of nature that we're following. And some of man's laws reflect that and seem reasonable under those conditions. And some of them are absurd, and they're a tyranny against us, and they're oppressing people. But we have to remember who's really in charge. You can call it God. You can choose not to call it God, as many people do. It's definitely not us. <laughs> we're... <laughs> Gosh. We're not even insignificant. We're just... There are two worlds or realms. The physical and the spiritual. One of these, the spiritual realm, cannot be seen or known by the physical senses alone. 